All right, everyone, it's time for a video response to Tulian Perspective. Uh, he wondered aloud, why don't more survivalists talk about rare earth? Uh, minerals, that is, of course. Uh, the materials necessary for green energy, for batteries, uh, for electronics, basically everything. Uh, and a looming problem with them being, of course, we are uh, running out of easily extracted supplies of rare earth. Uh, it requires strip mining anyway. That's a problem environmentally. Um, but the easily attained rare earth minerals are, you know, few and far. We're draining them far faster than the earth can possibly push them to the surface for extraction. Uh, I would say this. If Varg is correct and the earth undergoes a collapse of one sort or another, whether it's a war, demographic collapse, which I favor as a theory, uh, that is a behavioral sink. Essentially, the world stops reproducing at some point because people are overloaded with sex pheromones all the time. That's at least my takeoff of the uh, rat paradise experiment. The idea is uh, that all of those rare earth minerals that have been extracted, a lot of them will be in the cities. That is, that's where you've got a lot of cars, electronics, and so forth. If you had uh, a war, or if you had a demographic collapse and the resulting chaos from that killing off most people or an epidemic, whatever happens to happen, asteroid impact, Yellowstone, uh, those large cities would crumble and turn into ruins, and that's where you would find really the rare earth minerals um, from then on. But uh, under Varg's idea, the world population becomes more pastoral, more survivalistic and, and uh, technologically, uh, more more early than it is now. He sees that as a positive thing. Uh, you wouldn't need nearly as many rare earth minerals to supply such a, a group of people. Indeed, because of the amount of it available, um, as opposed to the actual population density, if you were living such a lifestyle, you probably could, with extremely small amounts of light industry, supply the entire world with solar power very easily because the technology would already be there. You'd simply have to maintain it. The materials would certainly be there. Um, then it simply becomes a matter of making sure that it doesn't fall apart and maintaining it. It would be possible. Uh, in fact, you might think of a vaguely technocratic future uh, in which a, a sort of anarcho-primitivism is practiced alongside uh, such a thing. Human wisdom thus continues to be maintained with books. You'd have printing, you'd have that availability. It could be manual or mechanical. You'd have your rare earth, you could have electricity. Now for some vague modern conveniences, uh, you've got to understand, even the most hardy people ultimately would not want to live a life without the basic things uh, that they consider themselves to need. Now, like hot water, <laughs> that might become a problem. Uh, electric lighting and so forth. The thing is, though, we've overstretched our, our energy capabilities. The fact that we're relying on fossil fuels shows this. If you had a much smaller level production locally of solar energy or wind, uh, whichever the case may be, you could at least provide the rudiments of technology while having an essentially primitivist lifestyle. It would be maintained, it would be renewable, now, because the materials are already there, they've already been mined, they've been amalgamated in limited locations, you'd simply have to mine the ruins and refine the materials. This would require a small amount of light industry to keep the whole thing going. Anything that's broken could then be uh, ground down into its subsequent parts, so to speak, and then recycled. It would be higher efficiency than today. It would be less, uh, there would be less energy output, but it would be far more efficient. You wouldn't need a high enough uh, output for, you know, powering the world as it is today because you wouldn't have, what is it, seven, eight billion people on its surface. You'd have, eh, probably under a primitivist model like that, a few hundred million would be about the peak population. Easily, easily taken care of. Easily capable of supplying its needs for food with or without mechanized farming. People were doing that for thousands of years. But you would have to have some industry available. Otherwise, mankind would be very vulnerable. I'm not sure that I agree fundamentally with wanting this kind of future. I think there are other avenues we can explore. But if you were going to make that work, 
the rare earth minerals would indeed still be there in, in, in enormous, vast quantities compared with the new population of the world. You've got to understand that the reason that we aren't able to recycle all of our material right now and make it work just by doing so is that the world population is large and growing. If it were very small, had a much lower cap on it, it would no longer be a problem. You could just recycle waste and you wouldn't have a, any difficulty whatsoever. And anyway, some of the energy uses you'd no longer you'd no longer have. I think he's thinking of a world in which there are no automobiles. It's a huge use. Um, you know, the, the type of mass production of energy that we do with centralized power plants ultimately is inefficient too. It's very inefficient to do it and then broadcast that power for significant distances as opposed to creating it locally. This is one thing on which I think the furthest left environmentalists might agree with Vargon, uh, which is rather amusing. As far as why the survivalists don't discuss the topic, it's because a lot of them probably don't know it's a problem. It's like a lot of people don't know that there's also a problem with the world's agricultural soils. I'm not sure whether Vargas pointed this out, but a large proportion of all the world's soil because of chemically uh, uh, driven farming, because of the use of chemical fertilizers, as opposed to the older methods, composting, um, you know, creating your own, you know, base fertilizer, base wood ash and so forth from the woods around a property, monoculture, lack of crop rotation, uh, and so forth. Mechanized farming certainly uh, destroys soil texture. Because of that, we have a, a carbon deficit within our soil. Most agricultural soil today lacks carbon. That's a big, big problem as far as the microbial life found in it. We've got the idea now where you can take soil from healthy fields, sprinkle a little bit of it in a field that's not so healthy and it restores bacteria. Long term though, does this take care of the problem? No. For thousands of years, man lived in harmony with nature when it came to farming practices, generally speaking. That is, the soil was restored uh, at the same rate it was being drained. Now, though, we've bred, and now with GMOs it's worse, uh, plants that are basically abominations uh, <laughs> that require man uh, to take care of them. They can't really do anything on their own. Now, you'll notice if you plant a vegetable garden, relatively few of the species will come back on their own unaided by you. You have to sow them. Corn, uh, flint corn, I believe, can't self-sow. Most other species can. Tomatoes can. They can self-sow. You'll see them coming up in little patches where tomatoes fell off the plant now, all spring long. That's an even bigger problem, though, than rare earth. I would say the world's starving because it's destroyed all of the generally used agricultural parts of the world. Uh, it will become a bigger problem, especially since in the early stages of the coming carbon collapse, which I think will happen, in the early stages of that, these countries that their, their normal agricultural regions have been decimated. They're not producing enough. They can't pump enough chemicals into them to keep plants alive, essentially. They've destroyed the soil. When that begins to happen, their immediate inclination won't be what we did with the Dust Bowl, which is we planted soybeans and started to try to rebuild the soil, and it, and it actually worked. That's what the United States did long ago. It was already a problem. Early stage mechanized farming. Some of those otherwise fertile but ultimately thin soils got completely drained uh, by grain crops. The immediate inclination in today's world, though, where everything needs to be right now, uh, we need our crops to grow now because it's part of the economy. It's not even so much to keep the population from starving. It's to make money. Their first inclination will be fell the forests. Oh, yeah, no, the 30% uh, the of Borneo that's not already deforested, we're going to need that. We're going to slash and burn it. The Amazon, we're going to slash and burn that too. It'll bring a total chaos to this world. And it'll happen if we don't develop the means to prevent it from doing so. Rare earth, though, is a problem. It's just that if uh, the demographic collapse he's anticipating occurs, it won't be a problem because all of those resources will be happily concentrated very near to the surface in what used to be mankind's cities there will be enough to supply the world population forever at the rate that he's talking about, assuming the population never gets above that few hundred million tops. He'd probably have some little city-states. I think in our uh, uh, an early model, 
uh, where you have compacted city-states uh, with simple infrastructure between them and the rudiments of technology, including green energy, would be a preferable future to the sort of, let's say, Bronze Age lifestyle I think that he's positing he desires. I think that there can be a balance between these things too. We're a technocratic world living essentially in city-states with a world population of a few hundred million scattered around, living in tandem with nature. No more land is, is farmed than necessary. The rest is all wild. Nature can take care of it. Man's impact should indeed be far lower. But we don't need to regress the world to the Stone Age to accomplish that. And the resources would already be there. We can take them and concentrate them in what become the new cities, which would be smaller, but they would still be metropolitan. There will always be a need for people, even if you're a non-electric society. There will always be the need for skilled labor. It won't just be survival farming. Uh, you need more farmers in such a situation, but you also need people to process goods because people enjoy, you know, maybe a cannery or something like that. It would be beneficial to people. That's essentially, yeah, that could be a better world. It could even have the internet, by the way. It would be all satellite derived. You'd simply need a repository of technology capable of deploying and maintaining such things. Yes, you could have a technocratic world that has a far lower population in which a large proportion of the world's uh, manpower goes towards simple, non-mechanized agriculture. It doesn't need to be non-mechanized per se. If you're letting most of the world go fallow, it's also not a problem because very small amounts of resources from that fallow land can be added to agricultural soil to keep it healthy. It is possible to do that. Basic composting. There's a lot of, uh, you know, nature doesn't need all of that waste unto itself. It's capable of draining resources from inorganic material over time. That's how the world's soils have built in the first place, largely. There's a large amount of organic matter there. If you went back long enough in, in the history of the world, you would find little more than bare rock, some sand, and a club moss. And over time, these slower growing, very small life forms, in tandem with others, the lichens then, gymnosperms up through the angiosperms, uh, slowly built up the world's organic content because they're capable of doing so. Uh, but long term, it might not matter. And I'll tell you why, because eventually there will be another ice age. We're in a warm period right now. When people ramble about global warming, they don't realize what they're talking about. We're in an interglacial period right now that's conducive to human life being technologically adept. It'll change. Uh, that would be the ultimate end limit of really civilization as we know it. A few tens of thousands of years from now, probably. If we're lucky. That's the end. As far as mankind's, you know, if I were buried here in a cemetery, my remains wouldn't even exist in 50,000 years. They would be completely plowed under by glaciers, probably. So, yeah, you might want to have yourself buried out in, in the high plateaus of Bolivia. Or, uh, yeah, maybe the American Southwest in some mesa somewhere. Because otherwise there won't even be remains long term. You know, if, you're, if you want aliens to come down and revive you, you're going to need to make sure there's something there for them to revive. But rare earth is a problem. Farg's correct. Uh, but the much smaller world population we would end up with under his uh, sort of primitivist model would still be privy to those resources they've already been extracted. You're talking in limitless supply, basically. For the population as it would be, it would be a limitless supply of metal, a limitless supply of rare earth minerals, a limitless supply of basically everything they could want. Now, the repository of all human endeavor would be in those urban areas. Even the smaller towns would be essentially laid waste to. They would be extracted too. You would never run out because you'd be recycling them, hopefully. Survivalism should be geared towards re-engineering society in a, in a scenario in which it's capable of doing so, where order has broken down, because they would become the new order. And people that do prepare for such things, uh, they do well even if it's just, hey, there's a tornado rolling through our town, get to the bunker, and, you know, we got food down there, we've got water, and, you know, the water's been poisoned by cholera, but we don't care because we've got a month-long supply. We can wait while order is restored. If order is restored, you've uh, outlasted any hazard. If order is not restored, well, I guess you're prepared. You've still got the rudiments of what you need to at least survive. Many people wouldn't. Then it becomes a problem of those hungry hordes 
trying to break down your door, uh, which is why typically people who are survivalists are also heavily armed. It's not just for show. It's not because they're paranoid. It's, a, it's because they would become paranoid in a shit-hits-the-fan scenario, I think. Rare earth's a problem, yeah. Carbon and soil's probably a problem. Maybe a bigger one. Um, deforestation is a problem. The world's desertifying at a rapid pace right now. Some areas will get greener. Part of that's due to natural shift in weather. Part of it, okay, maybe man-made, but who cares? Uh, if one place is getting drier, presumably... If the world's total amount of surface water is the same, another area is getting greener. At least that's how I would uh, suspect that it would work. I know there are plenty of people who disagree. It's a, it's a problem, and now uh, you see the new climate change argument boils down to, no, no, it's not even about like actual change, it's just about more extremes. So this area got more wet, that area got more dry. Okay, well, you're being honest, you're just assuming that man can do something about it. No, uh, we can't. We're screwed, probably, if you're correct. We're also screwed if uh, Mau uh, you know, Mouse Paradise is correct. We're screwed if uh, world population projections are correct. We're screwed if the draining of agricultural soils is largely irreversible due to unsound agricultural policy. We're screwed if the rare earth minerals run out before green energy can become fully self-sustaining. We're probably screwed if you get too many robots and AI systems. Uh, we're screwed if an asteroid comes. We're screwed if Yellowstone blows its top. Yeah, mankind's got some problems looming on the horizon. The general stability that we've experienced over the last century, other than, you know, the whole World War One and World War Two thing, that general stability is very, very short term. This is not a normal period in human history. The chaos that people see right now is abnormally small compared to the chaos that people always faced in the past. It's being propped up by technology and the extraction of energy resources. It's correct when Varg points this out. And it'll become a problem. It won't last forever. We, uh, Those of us who are, you know, already uh, adults uh, probably should feel lucky. The, 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 these things will continue to be available for our lifetimes, most likely. Now, we could still get hit by an epidemic, have a nuclear war or something. But as far as running out of resources uh, on any of those fronts, not so much a problem for us as for the children or grandchildren. For them, uh, yeah, I, I hate to say it, but Gen Z, you might live to see the day in which most people around you starve to death because the world has destroyed its agricultural capabilities. That's about all. Peace out.